If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Let's pray. Lord, as we look into what you define love as, we pray that you would help us to understand love from your perspective and not ours. Lord, that you would move us upward in our growth in the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We just started the book of Mark, and now we're taking a little break after the first week. Sorry, but it is Valentine's Day this week. Guys, if you didn't know, time to step up your game and start planning. You've got four days, five days, okay? So do something good. But, you know, there's no rule that says the guy has to do everything. So, you know, just a little hint. But, guys, it is your responsibility. How's that? All right. Today we're going to be talking about love. What is love? And I think this is a really important thing for the Corinthian church to understand because they were struggling in an area of their Christian walk, and I think a lot of churches today are struggling in the same way. And that the church of Corinth was very good at the outward appearance. They were pursuing spiritual gifts and excelling in them in ways that were probably beyond their peers. And so in their pursuit of spiritual gifts and using those God-given abilities, they lost sight of something which negated all the gifts that God had given the church in the first place. And that's what verses 1 through 3 all up, is all about. They didn't have a spiritual gift problem. They didn't have a problem with using tongues out of uh, order as much as they had a love problem. And this is where it all starts. This is where churches go askew. This is where problems happen in your walk with Jesus, even though you're doing Christian things. It can actually be tearing down the body. It could actually be hurting the cause of Christ because it has no love in the midst of it all. And so the Corinthians were using their gifts in a self-centered way. You know what we call it when a cell in the body starts doing its own thing? Cancer. Exactly. It grows into a tumor. It starts acting not productively for the rest of the body. And there are cancerous growths that pop up on a regular basis in the body of Christ when people begin to think of themselves before others. When it becomes about the gift rather than the reason for the gift. And so whether that be preaching, whether that be the gift of mercy or tongues or leadership, maybe it's even an ability of leading worship, giving money. When it becomes about those things, and we think that by doing them, we have completed our task on Sunday morning, we are falling short. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul was describing the gifts uh, in all their uh, variety and he was describing the importance of each one of those gifts to the body of Christ that they're given to build up one another. In chapter 14, he describes using gifts in an orderly fashion so that when we come together on Sunday morning, it's beneficial to people rather than distracting. Rather than becoming about a show, it becomes about serving one another. It becomes about glorifying God. 
And so the greatest evidence that you are truly spirit-filled is not how many gifts you have, it's how much love is coming from you. And so scripture speaks of love as being a fruit, something that is not a, a thing that you make happen, but it's rather something God produces in you by the Spirit. So what does Spirit-filled look like? It looks like love. It doesn't look like speaking in tongues. It doesn't look like uh, prophecy. It doesn't look like the gift of mercy or healing. Spirit-filled looks like Jesus Christ. And so that ultimately, I think, is one of those misunderstandings in concept that we have in the church today. And so the usefulness of the gifts of the Spirit depends on the fruit of the Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit is always preeminent over the gifts themselves. And so I wanted to look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22. It got really loud. Uh, <laughs> I think that's, is that me or is that you up there? It's me. <laughs> that's what he said. I'm just repeating it. All right. It'll, it'll come together. I'll talk kind of quiet. I think it's the compressor. If you can turn the compressor off, that compressor gives us problems. Or there's a flange on it or something. I don't know. Yeah. OK. Sound systems, they're fun. Kind of necessary sometimes, but you know what? I'll switch to this microphone. There we go. I'll switch to this microphone. How's that? All right. We, we don't have our uh, sound ninja. That's Les. He is recovering after a long trip. So there, does that sound okay? A little better, okay. Awesome. So what I was, I was saying, we, we don't have a, a gift problem, we have a sound problem. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> we have a love problem. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Let's look at those verses. It says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And now there are some expositors will point out the fact that love is the fruit of the Spirit since the word fruit is singular in the Greek language. The fruit of the Spirit is one thing, love. And then perhaps if that's what Paul originally intended to say, that the things that come after that describe what that fruit looks like. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so we find that throughout Scripture, love fulfills the law in a way that goes far beyond the law ever could. Because the law is about not doing certain things, the law is about following certain commands, but love is looking out for the best of another person rather than trying not to get nailed for doing the wrong thing. You see, there's a very different kind of motivation with regards to love. When you look in scripture and the understanding of the Greek language at the time that Paul wrote, there were four words in the Greek language for love, which would be helpful in our day and age, where we use love for all sorts of things. I love pizza. I love my kids. I love my dog. I think I'm in love. You know, I mean, we throw the word love around all the time. And so let's look at these four loves that exist in the Greek language. One that occurs a lot in the New Testament is the word phileo. Phileo, which is where we get the name of the city, Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love. So there it is. Phileo is an affection in friendship or brotherhood. Then there's another word in the Greek language, and that word is eros. This one does not occur in the Bible, and it's a sexual word or physical kind of love, okay? And so we know what that is when people say they made love. You know, that's what it's speaking of, eros. Then the word, again, that doesn't occur in the New Testament is storge, 
which is a family kind of love, where you love your parents and um, you also can use that word in terms of I love pizza. Okay, so it works with family, it works with things that you enjoy in that sense. But then the last type of word, and this occurs in the Bible as well as phileo, is the Greek word agape. And that's the highest form of love in the understanding of the Greek language. It wasn't used a lot uh, in common use, but it's used a lot in the New Testament. Why? Because God reveals a kind of love that goes beyond what most people love like. You know, we're talking about what we would call true love, true love, in the words of Princess Bride. Love, true love, is what brings us together today. I, I wanted to say that so bad at Cindy's wedding yesterday, but I didn't. I define it like this. Agape love is a love that sees something as infinitely precious and is willing to pay the ultimate price for the object of its affection. And we find this word agape in a number of places in the Bible. And one that really shocks me is in uh, the book of John, chapter 3, where it talks about that people who have rejected Christ, they do so because they love darkness. Or they love the world. Now think about that word agape in that context. It's somebody who gives up everything for the object of its affection. In that sense, giving up eternal life for the sin that they so desperately long for. And so we can see that love used in the wrong way. But we also see it used in the right way. And this is the way that God did. He saw you as infinitely precious. So much so that the infinite God would give his very life to save yours. He risked it all. And so because of that love, we are saved. Because of that love, we are God's children. And therefore, as God's children, we are to reflect the nature of our Father. And he produces in us something we can't produce in ourselves, And that is something that comes from him. And it's agape love. In the positive sense of loving our brothers and sisters in such a way as to lay down our own life for their good. It's loving your spouse in such a way as to put them first. It's loving your kids in such a way as to think about their needs before your own. You see that kind of agape love, even the world respects it. Even the world longs for that love. People are looking for it, and we find it in God. And so, in order to give it, you have to first experience it. And that comes through knowing and meeting Jesus Christ, who loved you so much that he died for you on the cross. And when you realize that his love is unconditional, and it's eternal, that you can't earn it, he just loves you. Knowing all your faults, knowing everything you've ever said, everything that you've ever done, that he chooses to love us is beyond our understanding. It surpasses our knowledge. We can't figure that out. Because our kind of love is always based on performance. You know, you love me, I'll love you back. Uh, You treat me wrong, hey, no more love for you. And so God is not that way. Although we were his enemies, although we had our fists shoved up in his face saying, get out of my life, he still loved us. And and Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's a love that is hard for us to get. But once you experience it, that's the first step in being able to love somebody with that same kind of love. But the second step is that the Spirit has to produce it in you because you don't have it in yourself. It's not something that comes naturally from your flesh to lay down your life for somebody who's your enemy. Even the world says that's ridiculous. Why would you die for somebody that hates you? Why would you lay down your life for a a terrorist that blew up a bunch of innocent people? 
You know, it's shocking. It's offensive. But that's the kind of love that God is calling us to. Remember when Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And then he explains, you know, even pagans love those who love them, but we're called to be perfect like our Father who loves his enemies. And so the love that we give, true love that we offer to one another, is, is not conditional, it's unconditional. And on that same basis, it's not earned, it's given. And it's not removed, it's continually offered even though somebody rejects it. Love is a decision, and it's not a feeling. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But one of the greatest things about love is that you'll notice it's others-centered. Others-centered. Maybe up to this point in your life, you've always seen love as something that gives you pleasure, something that makes you feel good, uh, brings fulfillment to your emotion. We get obsessed with, uh, romance or uh, sexual pleasure or whatever it is and so sometimes love becomes all about us and when we enter that place it's not this kind of love that we're being called to give because true love like this is other centered that means we are focused on that other person not on our needs not on what we get out of it but rather what we give to them and so that's a love that is otherworldly. I mean, that's a heavenly thing. It doesn't come from the face of this earth. And so the church in Corinth had lost that loving feeling. Just like the song. They, they had lost it. Why? Because uh, in chapter 1, we see them quarreling. And they were divided over little things. In chapter 3, we see that they're jealous with regards to each other. In chapter 3 through 4, we see that there's pride with regards to the leader that they follow. And we do that today. What church do you go to? You know, which books are you reading? What pastors do you listen to? And then people are like, oh, well, that's cool, but I listen to so-and-so. You know, they have way more people in their church. And so we get into this com comparative thing, and we compete with one another based on who we say our pastors are, what church we go to, who we listen to, what podcasts, what books we read. But Paul says all that stuff is fleshly. It's of this world. And so instead of taking pride, uh, the Corinthians should have been doing something else. Uh, they also, in chapter 4, we find they only offered, they only gave in ministry what they were comfortable with and Paul compares himself to them and he says, you know, I'm laying down my life. I'm dying here for ministry and, and you guys will only do that which is comfortable. And he kind of tongue in cheek, um, you know, calls them these uh, kings and, you know, blessed people. And then he's like this low guy that's suffering for the sake of the gospel. And in chapter 5, we see that they tolerated sin in the church. They were not willing to deal with the sin. And sometimes that seems like love, right? I mean, people don't want to offend another person, but really the unloving thing to do is to not point it out to your brother or to your sister. Obviously, we do that truth in love. They also were taking each other to court over rights of their own that were offended by somebody else. And so they drug him out in front of a judge of the world who wasn't even a believer to make a decision based on their disagreement. Uh, in chapter 6, they took advantage of people sexually. In chapter 8, they saw knowledge as more important than looking out for the weaker brother or sister who didn't have the same kind of knowledge. In chapter 11, they were filling their own stomachs. When it was communion time, today we do communion in such a way as we have these little cups and these little pieces of bread. That's like girly communion. Compared to what they had back then, they had a whole meal together. They would come together and have church, and then after church, they would eat a huge meal together, and that meal consisted of a cup and food by which they would break bread and 
do that in honor of the blood and the body of Christ. I wish we could do that every Sunday. Maybe one day we'll get a building and we will be able to do that. But for now, it's unfortunate that we have to use these little, little bitty cups and the little pieces of bread, you know, and we pass those things around. Not that it's any less powerful, mind you, when your heart is right in doing it, but understand, when they came together, there were some poor people that came to church because they were going to get the only balanced meal during the week. Perhaps they would have gone certain days without any food at all, but they come to church and everybody pulls together their stuff in this great potluck and they called it a love feast. And during that time, there were some people that would cut in line and get in front and fill up their plates and take all the food so that the poor people, although they came to church to not only eat but to partake in communion together, would find themselves without any food. And Paul was pretty mad. He was really upset with how that was affecting the church. And, and you know, he was even pointing out that some of them were getting sick as a punishment for what was going on. You know, read it, 1 Corinthians 11. It's pretty intense. And that's where he comes in and says, you know, if you partake in communion, you should do it thoughtfully, with the right heart. So think about how unloving that was for somebody to fill their own stomachs and let all those with empty stomachs to go without. Very self-centered. And then in verse, our chapter 12, um, we see the spiritual gifts listed and we know that they were using them for their own benefit. So when love isn't prevalent in the church, sick things happen. Things get out of whack, and that's where the church gets a bad name. That's where folks, in their desire to be at church, stop going to church sometimes, because the church isn't being what they're supposed to be in the first place. It becomes about performance. It becomes about facade being fake, playing the game. And, you know, honestly, people aren't stupid. They can see through it. But for some reason, we choose sometimes to deceive ourselves and think that that's okay, and then eventually love gets put on the back burner. It's the sin that is allowed in the church. Sometimes. You know, we jump on all these social issues we jump all over certain sins, but the greatest thing we should be doing in loving one another, we just say, ah, oh, it's all right, we'll let that one go. You know, it, it's out of balance. And so, if love is absent from our life, um, the, first verse, the first three verses tell us that you can speak in tongues, but you're only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So, if you have not love, and you're doing something that seems so spiritual, you're just making empty noise. Also, if you have prophetic powers, if you understand mysteries, knowledge, and you have this great faith that can move mountains, but you have not love, it says you are nothing. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty intense. And then lastly, you can give all, away all your riches. You can even be burned at the stake. But it says if you don't have love, you gain nothing. You might enter heaven, but what's your reward? You enter as one escaping through the flames. You know, you come into heaven maybe smelling like smoke. But when we have love, that's what we find that God is so pleased when love is being expressed in his body. He's so pleased when he sees true love expressed in a marriage and towards children, and sometimes children towards parents, of course, as well. If you're not loving, then you're not doing much. It says you're nothing and you gain nothing. Pretty intense. So love is other-centric. A couple verses to look at real quick. 1 John 15, 13. I'm sorry, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That other-centric, that self-sacrificial love. And then in John 13, 35, 
It goes on to say, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, Christ's disciples, as opposed to some man's disciples. If you want to be known as Jesus' disciples, it says, if you have love for one another. That's how you know. You see the love for each other, not a love for self, not a love for the world, but a love for one another. So what does this love look like? Well, verses 4 through 8 tell us. As you read through these verses, there's three things love is. There's eight things love is not. Four things it always does, and one it is never. Sounds like a riddle. There's more negative statements about what love isn't than there are the positive ones. Why is that, I wonder? Is it because we get it wrong so often? We think love is this or love is that, and Jesus is like, nope, not that, nope, not that, nope, not that. I've got to tell you what it is. But I also got to tell you what it isn't. So let's look at these 16 things. And we will try to get through them not too slowly. First, love is patient which means to suffer a long time with somebody, to not get angry when things aren't changing the way that you want them to. It means to bear with offenses and personal injuries to you. Now, it's a very good thing that this is one of the major attributes of God. God is patient. Good thing he is. If I was God, I would have just flicked mankind off the face of the earth a long time ago. But he hasn't done that. Why? Because it says in Numbers 14, verse 18, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Thank God that he's a patient God. He's patient with you also in 2 Peter 3, 9, not wanting anybody to perish but everybody to come to repentance. Why doesn't Jesus come back right now? It's because God wants as many people to repent and come into the kingdom as possible, although it may be a long time in waiting. And it may be difficult to go through what the world is doing right now. There's a reason for it. And that's because God is patient, waiting for that last person to accept Christ. You know, and so... We're given that reason. So as you go through each one of these characteristics, understand that each one of these characteristics are a characteristic of God. They're not something that he has not done already to you or for you. Okay, the second one, love is kind. This is the only place in the New Testament this word occurs, but it seems to be related to the same kind of kindness that God gives us that leads us to repentance in Romans 2, verse 4, it says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And so how is God kind to us? It's that he takes the initiative to meet our needs. And he does it in a way where he doesn't like go, oh, You're such a jerk. You don't even deserve this, but I'm going to do this for you anyway. He doesn't do that. He's kind about it. And so when we're kind to others, that means we're considerate, we're helpful, we're observant, we're like watching and seeing what are the needs of those around us. We're generous, we're gentle. Thirdly, love does not envy, which means to desire in a negative aspect here, of course, to be heated or to boil with envy, to pursue, to strive after something that's not yours. Now, envy is like one step worse than coveting in terms of a progression of somebody's heart. Coveting is wanting something somebody else has. All of us know what that's like. 
wanting something somebody else has. But envy takes it a step further in that not only do you want what somebody else has, you want that other person not to have it. If you can't have it, well, neither should they. That's envy. Envy is wanting something bad to happen to somebody else because everything in their life seems so good. Familiar with it? Struggle with it before? Then you're human. <laughs> but love doesn't do that. Love, rather, when they see the blessing in another person's life, love says, praise God. I'm going to rejoice with you. I don't have this, but man, I'm so glad that you do. You see, that's other-centric. Uh, love, fourthly, does not boast. To boast is to put something on display, to put yourself on display. In a sense, it's wanting somebody to envy you. So it's taking envy in another direction. Fifthly, love's not arrogant, which literally means to be puffed up. You ever see guys do this? when they get in a, a fight or a tiff. Literally, sometimes people kind of put their chest out. Really? Come on. I'll take you on. Hold me back, you know. And their friends grab them and they, they get all uptight. Arrogance. Seeing yourself as better than somebody else. That's one of the more simple understandings of that. Arrogance. Thinking you're of a different class. You're beyond what another person has either um, materialistically or where they've come spiritually that you think you're hot stuff. Or even taking credit for what God has done. Love's not arrogant that way. Sixthly, love is not rude. Being rude means to be disgraceful to somebody else. To disrespect them. Uh, this can happen towards being rude to God. We disrespect God or we disrespect another person by saying something that was just totally disrespectful of them and their personality, their, their value before God. Uh, we can do things that are totally um, disrespectful. Of course, you guys were probably brought up not to make certain bodily noises out loud. Why? Because it shows disrespect for the people around you. That you would open up that kind of gross stuff in the midst of somebody else's presence. Well, in verse, or the seventh thing is, love does not insist on its own way. That's hard for some of us. To not insist that things are done your way right now. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, we're given a picture of what this looks like to do the opposite, to do what is loving. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, it's not that your interests don't matter. It means that when it comes between your interests and somebody else's, you choose theirs for their good, for what's best for them. Unless they're insisting on something that's not good for them, of course, that's when you put your foot down and you say, nope, sorry. You know, I remember um, when my son, Tony, it's my son Tony's birthday today, by the way. Say happy birthday. He's 13. He's an official teenager. But when he was younger, he one day was following me around as I was spraying down my driveway with, I didn't have a pressure washer, but I had the hose set on high and had the, one of those nozzles that made it really tight, made the spray real tight and real um, hard on the concrete. And so I was cleaning it off and then he came over to me and he wanted me to spray him in the mouth. And I was like, no, you know, you can't. You can't do that. I'm going to hurt you. And, you know, he threw a fit because he's our extreme boy. He always wanted to do things that are crazy and fun and boy-like, you know. And so he was really upset with me, but I had to put my foot down. Why? Even though he insisted on that, I'm not going to give him something that's not good for him. So there are times when we insist on another way. 
The eighth thing is that love is not irritable, or that means to be provoked. I think some of us are just kind of irritated people. We get upset, we get bothered, we get our feathers ruffled, we get hot under the collar, just at comments people make, you know, people pulling uh, in front of us on the road or just passing us on the road. Oh, they're speeding, you know, those guys. Crazy speeders. Um, And so we get irritated. I would venture to say, although we might say certain people are irritating, that sometimes we have it totally wrong. I don't think God is irritated at people, at his creations. I might be grieved over their sin. Does he really get irritated, though, at somebody's personality? Does he get irritated at the way they look? I don't think so. Love is not irritable. Think about that when you wake up in the morning and your spouse says, hello, honey, with bad breath, you know? I mean, (laughs) think about all those little situations that might really irritate you and begin living in love. The ninth thing, not resentful. Literally, this means does not count up wrong. Does not count up wrong. You know what reveals when you really count up wrong in your own heart is when you get in an argument and you pull something out from the past. And you're like, but you, three weeks ago, you did this. Oh, really? I didn't know you were keeping count. That's what that means. Not resentful or not counting up wrong. you got to let things go. If you keep dragging up something that happened three weeks ago, five years ago, ten years ago, then, you know, it's going to be really hard to live out this true love with your spouse or with your kids or with your friends or even in the church. It's the thing about church. Things happen in church just because you're with people. People are going to irritate you. People are going to hurt you. And when we keep a record of wrong, is sometimes we can get into that place and we come to church and we're like, we got our defensive mode on, we got our shield, we got our armor, and that, it just shouldn't be that way among family, you know? We just have to let it go. We got to forgive and move on and be able to walk in among the church family and be like, you know what? I love these guys. Man, they're messed up, but I love them anyway. Even though they've hurt me, you know what? I know they're imperfect. And I know they still love me. So, you know, I'm going to choose to love them. Even when they don't understand what they're doing sometimes. Choose to love. Then love rejoices with the truth. One of the greatest ways I think I see this is rejoice when somebody is in the Word of God and maybe they mention a verse to, instead of be thinking, oh, you, you Bible thumper, you know, you goody two-shoes or whatever, that you think, praise God that the Word of God is oozing out of this person's life. Praise God that they're reading their, their Bibles and we rejoice in the truth when we see it in their minds and on their lips But we also rejoice in the truth when we see them living the truth. When we see them living the truth. Truth, being lived out, can be something you don't rejoice in because they remind you of your imperfections. The things that you're not getting right and that you're feeling guilty about when you see that in somebody else, that they're being obedient, you know, rejoice in it. Praise God that they've overcome alcoholism. Praise God that they aren't struggling with uh, whatever it may be that you are struggling with. Rejoice in the truth. Bear all things, it also says, which means to cover, to cover over. Scripture says love covers over a multitude of sins. And you might have the dirt on somebody. You've got the lowdown. You know their faults. You know their weaknesses. And 
even in the midst of a conversation, they do something that's like a bump in the road. It jostles you, it upsets you, but love covers over. And we choose not to make issue with certain things because really, if you were to follow one person around and become critical about them, you know, they're so far from perfect, you could say a million things about them that are wrong. But love covers over. Love believes all things. I like this one. Sometimes we can become really suspicious and cynical of other people and we're questioning their motives even. Even when they're nice to us, we're like, okay, what's going on? What's behind the scenes here? What do they want from me? You know, if you become that cynical, that's a bummer place to be. God can heal you. God can bring you out of it. But believing all things is like you assume the best instead of assuming the worst in a situation. Somebody's not at church today. Oh, they must be out golfing. You know, they're probably out just disobeying the Lord. But here I am, you know, angelic Angela at church, like everybody else should be. You know, we can get into that mode. Believe the best. You know what? They must be sick. I'm not going to try to figure out what is wrong. Pick up the phone and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, believe all things. Hope's all things. You know, I'm really glad that God had hope for me and God had hope for you. What if he said, you know what? You're so messed up. I don't have any hope that there's going to be anything better for you. You're on your own. Thank God he's not that way. When Christ came to this earth, even though he knew you were a sinner in rebellion to God, he had hope that there was something glorious in your future. And so we approach one another with that same kind of hope. Our spouse, our kids, you know, sometimes things get really dark. And it's not that they're always that dark. Sometimes we just talk ourselves into the closet where things are dark. And things seem so horrible and they seem so impossible. But love hopes all things. Looking for that glimmer of hope. Expecting God as something good. Then there's two more. Love endures all things. I like this word because it's a military term that means an army holds up their position no matter what kind of opposition comes their way. Hold your ground, men. You know, that kind of idea. Don't give any ground to the enemy. Rather, charge forward. You're enduring through all the ravages of the war. And then lastly, love never ends. If it can't be earned, it can't be lost. That's God's love. In Romans 8, 39, 38 and 39, it says this, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation, which is pretty much everything he's covered, right? There's nothing that will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Some of you think you've lost his love because you've just said one thing too many times you've thought some thought too many times you've done some action too many times and that you're done for no way God can forgive you you're absolutely wrong love never fails And so because of that truth in our life, it gives us the confidence to have the love that never fails with people around us. Because we're not doing this alone. We're doing it with God who's done that with us. And so because we've experienced it, we can offer it. Now when I read to you verses 4 through 8, I want to point out something to you in the Greek that's really neat. Love is the now. So when you see love in those verses, that's the noun, love, the idea of love. But every one of those descriptions about love is a, anybody know? 
I heard it over here. A verb. That's right. Love is the noun. Every one of those descriptions is a verb. I find it interesting. Every one of those verbs has nothing to do with an emotion. There might be emotions around it, but the main idea is doing something. It's an action. When it really comes down to it, love is not just a word. I love you, baby. You know I love you, girl. You know, or whatever we say. Uh, maybe we don't even say love. We say, you know what I mean. You know. Love is not a word so much as it is an action. Love's not a feeling so much as it is a choice to do what you know you ought to do, what God calls you to do. Now, sometimes the emotions are there, and then it's so much more fun when the emotions are there. But sometimes the emotions are not there. That doesn't mean love is not there. Don't get confused. True love does the right thing even when you don't feel like it. So you don't fall out of love. You might have lost that loving feeling, but you haven't fallen out of love. You can't do that. Love never fails. Rather, you choose to love in spite of the struggle inside. So love's more about doing than feeling. Check this out. In 1 John 3.16, there's another John 3.16, but it's 1 John 3.16 also has to do with love. But this is your chance to love. It says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and Truth. Notice that. Not word or talk, deed, which is an action. Do it. And truth. That it's in line with that true love that we see in Scripture. And so, if you claim to have love, yet you don't back it up with action, then you're not being obedient. You're not being truly loving. So, Valentine's Day is coming. Some of you are single. Some of you guys might not be married. You might be too young or you might be single through whatever it may be, divorce or uh, you've just never been married before. But this applies to you too, even though it's Valentine's Day. And that day might make you a little sick. You know, you might just <clears throat> throw up just a little bit every time. Valentine's Day comes around. But think about it in terms of agape love. True love, the ultimate love, that you don't need the romantic love in order to live it out, but rather it's an opportunity to come back to the most important thing. Even if you're single, love your brother and sister the way you are. Remember God's love for you. And for those of us that aren't single, it's an opportunity to remember, although you, you should be trying to be romantic a little bit, I think, guys. It's hard. Sometimes we just don't get it. And those of you guys who do get it, you know, you just make me sick. <laughs> but sometimes we get it right. I think it's dumb luck when we do. But romantic love is good. But remember, when we talk about loving each other, our spouses that it comes to this agape love. We need to love each other the way God loves us and that you don't fall out. You hang on. You keep doing what you know you should be doing because love does. That's true love. Find a way to demonstrate. Find a way to show it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for being a God who loves us beyond our comprehension. Lord, that your love goes beyond anything in this world. Please break us of the thought that it's based on performance. And Lord, help us to step into the confidence of knowing that it is totally based on your character and nothing else. 
We ask that your spirit would produce in us by your power that you would fill us to overflowing so that we would love the way that you've called us to love. And God, please forgive us for giving into the flesh. Lord, for giving up on those that you've placed in our life. God, bring us back to that place where our feet are standing firm on the rock. Where we know that you're alive and well within us. Because we see the greatest fruit of love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.